morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, church. So good to have you with us here today. How about we just stand in the presence of God? Let's expect that He is going to meet us here today. Gracious and loving Father, we love you and we want to meet with you this morning. Lord, would you help us position ourselves before you so that we can see you as you are. We know you love us. We know you understand us better than we understand ourselves. And we come in your presence now. We want to glorify you and praise you and lift you on high. You are worthy of all our praise and we love you, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have a great time of worshiping this morning. And don't forget this morning, you can take communion at any time. And uh, you can come up to the front and take communion and pause before the Lord. This is the time of heaven. This is the time of worship that we want to have this morning. In Jesus' name, we have a great time. Amen.
always faithful, God. We're going to sing this song together. Speaking of God's faithfulness through every generation. From Moses to Jacob to David to Mary to you and I. This is the same God from the beginning of time. The same God today. The same God forevermore. And if you're in this space, just stuck in a rut, or you're just kind of lost, call on Him. Call on His faithfulness. Remind yourself who you worship. Who is your King? Because this God is the God who moves mountains. This God is the God who is faithful forever. God of power and God of mercy. And He hears you. moment, you kind of just want to come to the table and drink of the cup, reminding yourself of His faithfulness. You're welcome. This communion stations in different parts of the auditorium, but just, just come. Just come and worship.
I've been preparing my heart. Uh, you know, I often go to the cafe and I sit there and enjoy time and just the, the word, uh, the words continually living and active, living and active kept on coming to my heart. That I needed to encourage you this morning that the word of God is living and active. Amen. It's living and active. We know those verses from Hebrews chapter 4. For the word of God is living and active sharper than any double-edged sword it penetrates even to the dividing the soul and spirit joints and marrow it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart nothing in all creation is hidden from god's sight 
everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Living and active, living and active. Why this keeps on coming to my mind this morning in my heart. And, you know, it's interesting. I want to tell you a quick little story. Uh, Every Saturday and Sunday morning, I go to the cafe and I struck up this relationship with a guy that I will call Bible Man. Okay, Bible Man. Interestingly, why he's called Bible Man to me is because he goes, he works at the tip. He works at the tip and uh, he they receives deliveries, all that kind of, not deliveries, he receives rubbish. And uh, for some reason, he's got this fascination with books. He's got this fascination with books. And so the rubbish comes in, he sorts it, he takes out all the books. I mean, all the books. And he takes them at home and he sorts them and he puts dates on them and he looks at them. And he, he, but he pulls all these books out. But he was telling me a story uh, about how two, uh, two or three weeks ago, a big load came in, it was all wet, 100% wet. Uh, like there was other things in the, in the load of rubbish, um, you know, just waste and, and cardboard and, and garden clippings and all that kind of stuff. And he was sorting through it. Everything was drenched, absolutely drenched. And then at the bottle, but at the bottom, there was this book. Obviously a Bible, 100% dry, 100% dry. And, you know, he, he just said, you know, what I've realized is that I can't just leave this book, the Bible there. I can't just let it go to the tip. Something is drawing me there. That drew me there because it was dry. Everything else was wet. That's the word of God. But I just cannot just leave it there. I've got to pick it up. I've got to take it home. And then he brings to me the next Saturday a bag of Bibles to show me every single one of them. Yesterday he did the same, looking at Bibles from 1850 and things like that. The the thought that comes to me is that the Holy Spirit, in some way, this guy is not a believer, is prompting him that there is something powerful in this book more than just words, more than just a, an idea or two. This is the living and active Word of God that transforms our life. It gets to the part of your heart that you cannot get to yourself. Amen? It divides the soul and the spirit and opens up what God wants to do in your life. Today, church, I want you to declare and hold up, you know, figuratively or just hold up your Bible if you have it in your hands and say, I live by the word of God, which I know is empowered by the spirit. And I know it's living and active. And I will step out into my world today, tomorrow, knowing that the word is alive in me. Can we say that now? The Word is alive in me when the Holy Spirit. The Word is alive. The Word is alive in me. It is living and active. Amen? It is living and active. We have this treasure of the Word of God, but we also have this treasure of the Holy Spirit who leads us as a person into His presence using the Word of God. And boy, oh boy, we can live a life that is full because we can see the truth come alive in our lives. Today, Lord, I stand on Your truth. I stand on your truth. I am going to walk further into what you are doing because I trust that your word is true. Lord Jesus, would you move in your spirit over these people and they will understand that they can step out in faith knowing that the word of God is true. You are living and active today, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you. There's a world out there that needs you, Lord. And you've called us to be disciples, representing you to everyone, everywhere, with everything that we have. And this day we declare that you are living and active through your word, through the Holy Spirit, and that we're going to step forward in you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are not dead. You are alive. Living and active.
What a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. What a friend. It's right here. Let's just sing and just offer up your heart to the Lord. Thank you. Temptations. Take it to the Lord in prayer. He's living and active. We should never be discouraged. He's living and active. us at every point if we're listening. Lord, I pray like my friend Bible man as he's trying to listen to some form of prompting and take a step. He, he knows there's something that you're doing. Lord, I pray that each one of us at every stage of our life, you know our lives, that you are prompting us, giving us faith to take a step forward, that we would be living like you're alive. Not like you're dead, like you're alive. You are living and active through your word through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? God is living and active. He's alive. Amen. Praise God. Why don't you turn around and have some time blessing one another, encouraging one another and welcoming one another.
Do we have anybody here new for the first time? We would love to welcome you, give you a bag. If you live, raise your hand or somebody next to you can raise your hand or raise their hand. You're not new. Uh, we just want to welcome you and thank you for coming today. So good to have you with us in our church. got to have your attention now we've got something very very special very very special uh, one of our members here at the church has turned 90 years of age that's Wynne Morgan here Wynne I think we're going to start by singing happy birthday, all right? Juliet's going to lead us. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Look at her, she's over there. We've got both, well, no, don't look at me. Look at Wynne. Wynne is there and we've got beautiful photos of her as a young, lovely little girl. Um, Wynne, we just really wanted to honour you this morning. You've been in this place a whole long time and you've blessed many of us. My heart for you, and I think, uh, I don't know if I said this to you, but I certainly reflected it at Shirley's funeral. Um, that there is a few ladies around my mum that are my second mums and you're one of those and I appreciate your heart. You have been from the day one, like I can remember at Boys Brigade back in the day in this church, you read us books about Miles and the screwdriver, yeah? And yeah, and I, I remember I read them to my kids. Um, but it's like just the love that you had. I always used to wonder, why is a lady coming to Boys Brigade? I, re quite, I, I remember that. Uh, why is a lady coming to Boys Brigade to teach the boys? But your softness of heart taught a lot of us, you know, and that group of boys, you know, we've now got a pastor over there in the US speaking to 22,000 people on, on days, you know. We've got, um, you know, people head of religious education at Scotch College. Those boys taken big steps from that point one thing I do remember though we went to your house as boys and we swam in your pool and you had a little sign up that said do not pee in my pool I don't swim in your toilet so so thank you for that wisdom at every level of my life uh, Pastor Chi's got some thoughts in fact Julia first I'm Julie, I'm currently leading the women's ministry and on behalf of all the women in our church, we want to honour you um, because over, over the years, you know, you've been here as long as I can remember and over the many forms of women's ministry, you have always been there, always championing women's ministry. She emails us if she can't come because she so much wants to be there and after an event, if she's been there, she emails us to encourage us about you know how encouraging it has been um, but if you have ever had the opportunity to sit with her or be seated with her even at an event randomly I guarantee she will speak words of life into you every single time when we hear back from women they say oh is that win and then they tell me how she's told them amazing stories um, how she's told them of God's faithfulness and all the things she's been through in her life she is always still full of joy and she just you just radiate Jesus you are seriously the fragrance of Christ everywhere you go so we want to honor you and we hope to see you at many more women's events because we know that you um, value them and you think they're important and that 
you love to rub shoulders with other women and your very presence is just encouraging every single time. Uh, so we honour you and, you know, we look forward to many more years beyond 90 <laughs> to hear from you and be inspired by you. So thank you for being a role model and for showing us how to live a life, you know, binded to Christ no matter what you've been through and no matter what age we are, 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s, this woman of God can speak so much encouragement and life into you. So thanks. <laughs> Uh, so when I, I try to swim once a week in the public pool, now I feel like I'm swimming in the toilet. Because like, <laughs> I'm sure people pee in the toilet, uh, in, the, in the pool. Um, hello, I just want to say thank you um, just for who you are and the life of full faith, love, legacy that you try and make. You know, when I hear your stories, I could hear that you're a woman trying to pioneer that God can use women for the kingdom of God in your day and age in that season time and I think I've learned a lot from you in those random conversations you know it might feel you know here and there but like especially one of the key things was so I'm a first generation Christian you know and in our culture we understand about leaving you know physical material inheritance but what I've learned from you is leaving spiritual inheritance and every single time you tell me about what you sow into your children into your grandchildren the intentionality around that it just reminds me because you know like what we do will come and go but what we invest into people and how you were so intentional to leaving a spiritual inheritance to your children and grandchildren that's really touched me you know and, and great-grandchildren sorry and then great-great-great-great-grandchildren <laughs> um, but look I just want to say thank you for that and um, I was thinking about a word and the word will be Proverbs 4.23 which I, I love guide your heart right because it's the wellspring of life and I think 90 years is a lot of life to live. And, sorry? Yeah, and you can go. <laughs> and, and why the significance? Because a lot of stuff happens in life. But when I look at you, when I speak to you, I, I see that you've guarded your heart against bitterness, against resentment, against disappointment. And then instead you've guarded it with hope, love, your first love in God and then faith. And so when I speak to you, it's like you're a refreshing well. You know, and that's not always the case when people live 90 years of life. So I just want to say thank you for that and for modeling that, that that can happen. Yeah, thank you. All right, Scott. Would you like to say one or two words on the spot? You don't have to. overwhelming thank you so much thank you to our beloved pastors thank you for so many of you who have known me for over 60 years been here in this place God has been good as we've been singing and anything that I have been able to leave with you I pray that it'll be effective in your lives and in your family's lives you children, your grandchildren, and eight, my eight great-grandchildren. <laughs> God is so good, and I just thank you for this lovely fellowship that's strengthened me and encouraged me through many, many years. Just thank you so much. Bless you all. Keep walking with the Lord. Thank you. We have this uh, this plant for you. Uh, we, we've been growing it for a long time. Oh, praise God! Isn't that special? Uh, as much as we're honouring Win, as much as we're honouring honouring Win, there we are honouring God because you know that He's the one who has sustained her, but also He's the one that she felt was worthy of putting her trust in day in and day out and that's something that we can all take great example from so thank you 
All right. Uh, just a, a reminder from time to time, uh, you may want to uh, put in prayer requests or praise requests. We have little cards that are at each of the communi- communion stations. And we'd love you to put those in because we're, we're wanting to pray and engage with what God is doing in your life. So we encourage you to do those, uh, but you can also do it online. Uh, there is a QR code uh, there or on the side of your seat that enables you to uh, request prayer uh, and pastoral care. Uh, we want to bless you in that way. If you are new here today, we've got a connect corner here over there, um, which is where we would love to meet you and spend some time with you uh, and get get to know you. Uh, We really want to engage you with the life of this church. It's a beautiful place to be. You know, we have members that are here for 60 years plus. Uh, Must be a good place. Um, So we love this place, yeah? Uh, We can meet you just over there in the corner where you see the flag. Uh, Yesterday we had just a a wonderful time um, at the Heart Retreat. Um, So many, uh, we had about 60 to 70 people at the Heart Retreat yesterday. Just a beautiful time of coming before God, um, just trying to understand how God works in our heart to change us to be more like Him. Uh, We want to encourage you so much, if you uh, haven't signed up for the next one to come, and I... I How do I phrase this? I'm not even sure how to phrase uh, why you should come uh, in the sense that I don't want to make it a promotion. If the Lord is prompting you in your heart to open up uh, to a new level of discovery of who you are in Him and what, how He can grow you to the next level, you'll know. That's probably the best. You'll know. You'll know He'll be tugging on your heart on your in your spirit that you need to take a step out and just go on a journey uh, through basically there's four steps to it there's in, invitation conviction surrender and belief and we had a wonderful time yesterday we had a cross set up over there and people came in uh, and basically submitted to God surrendered to God a bunch of things and then said this is how I'm going to believe uh, going forward and it was very powerful very powerful. So I can, if I can encourage you, I don't think we've got a QR code up there or anything like that. You can register by the QR code by the side of your seat or on the website. We have another one in June and uh, this is a key part of what God is doing in this church and we would love many of you to come on the journey uh, if you can. So that was an amazing time on Friday night. We have the AGM coming up. Uh, which is on this Thursday night at 7.30pm. Uh, you can join in person or online. So uh, if you are a member, we uh, really encourage you to be there. Um, your, your presence is important um, to really invest in the life of the church. Connected to that, uh, we have membership classes uh, coming up next Sunday. Uh, next Sunday, Pastor Kyle runs it membership classes so it's always an exciting time Um, you never know quite what you're going to get in the sense that he's always going to tell a joke or two but then he's going to tell you the real stuff about what this church is on about as well so if you uh, have been attending for a while and you want to get to know more about what this church is on about and how to connect we would love for you to become a member Uh, so you need to go to the membership class and then you know there's a bit of a sign up process but it's investment into the life of the church in the long form and we would really encourage you to sign up for that via the qr code or emailing hello at claytonchurch.org.au you uh, fit you fit uh, is uh, happening again for term two and we have two parts to you fit this time we have let's work out let's work out which starts on the uh, 4th of May and it's for eight weeks going through uh, to the 29th of June uh, basically what it is it's uh, with mana fitness like it was last year um, they're going to take us through uh, its, its, its fitness uh, and it would be really good uh, if many of you could sign up because I tell you what, we're seeing people from the community come and we want to, we want to encourage you to build relationships uh, with the people from the community. Uh, so that's, uh, it's, it's, it's well priced, it's only $7.50 per session uh, and uh, we would encourage you to, to be a part of that, uh, those fitness classes. Also, we have Let's Move Line Dancing. Who's into a bit of line dancing? 
Yeah, I'm not, but uh, I'm sure many of you, because I just don't have the coordination, um, unfortunately. Maybe that's why I should go to line dancing classes, to get the coordination. But uh, Rawhide line dancing uh, are our instructors, and that's just an amazing time at 8.30 a.m. Uh, where you can just, it's part of fitness, really, and uh, just also building community. Uh, so really see it as if you want to join with that kind of thing, it's also part of uh, building community with those outside the church. Um, you can be as young as 14 or as old as in your 70s or 80s or 90s uh, and enjoy that uh, in the cafe area starting on the 4th of May. Uh, please sign up. We have you fit. Let's talk Parenting, have we got that up there? Yes, let's talk parenting. That's starting, registrations are opening this Sunday and uh, it's just a parenting teens course. So if you're interested in that, you have teenagers, we would encourage you to join in with that. Uh, There's many people that have had great, um, that have been encouraged deeply by that. That starts on the 3rd, on a Friday night, in person here at the church on the 3rd of May. Uh, at 7:30 p.m., there's a cost of $10, but uh, we would uh, encourage you to register for that if you have teenagers, or you have teenagers, uh, kids that are growing into teenagers, because that's kind of what happens, you know. You get kids, they grow, you get teenagers, and then you got to send them out the door, and hopefully they're all right by that time. So, um, yeah, we would really encourage you to be part of that. All right, have I got? Have I done all my announcements yet? No. no. Uh, so we have uh, you would have heard last week about Peter McRae and his uh, his passing and we have his funeral coming up uh, not this week but the week after on the Wednesday 23rd at 1.45 for viewing and 2pm for a funeral uh, and uh, we would encourage you to attend 24th. I've got the date wrong in here. It's the 24th, which is the Wednesday. Hopefully it's right on the screen. It is great. Uh, so we would encourage you to attend. It would be awesome. Uh, just to really encourage those from especially Cafe Care, which is what Bill leads. And um, people are going through a hard time uh, at this point in time, and it would be great for you to attend. So we encourage you. Coming to a time of offering and really... Uh, to be honest the uh, offering kind of thoughts that I had I shared with you earlier so we're just going to pray we're just going to ask the Lord to bless us Lord thank you so much thank you so much that you do bless us that you work in our lives that you are alive that your word is living and active and the Holy Spirit comes to uh, to make that word come alive apply it to our situation in every way We thank you for your ministry over the years to us individually, to the church, and we submit it to you. Lord, would you uh, encourage us as we give and would you encourage us to to be generous but also have this as part of our day-to-day discipleship of giving uh, to your work. We love you. We honour you. In Jesus' name. So there's a bunch of ways that you can give. Uh, you can see it up there on the screen via the Tithely app, via uh, EFT, and also you can give via cash in the box at the back. Pastor Kyle is going to come and bring the Word of God to us now. Why don't you come up here? I want to pray for you. Lord, I just thank you that this man uh, is, is after your heart. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen him now as he speaks and brings your word. Lord, we know that it is alive. Lord, I thank you uh, that you work in us through the Holy Spirit. I pray we are receptive now for what you want to do in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, man. Thank you. Sorry, it was going to be a short service, and then people just kept on talking. Um... (laughs) But I want to keep my job, so I won't say who. I'll just chuck it out there. And if you come to the same conclusion as me, that's what happens. We are united in mind and body. Um, 
Uh, yeah, so today, uh, oh sorry, hello, my name is Kyle, uh, pleased to meet you guys. Uh, I uh, look after the next gen for the church, which is uh, one of the best ministries going around, so if you want to get involved, please come and see me, and we will plug you in if you are suitable. Um, and I'm going to be speaking uh, from Ephesians today. But uh, I just had a little thing that I wanted to share at the start uh, that's sort of not really connected to my message, but I I felt prompted to say, and then I also realized that other people have felt prompted to say things throughout the service, and so I apologize. My actual message is quite short. So don't worry, this this little, like, what's the appendix, the thing that goes at the start or the bottom? Uh, This doesn't go for too long. But I was just thinking uh, this morning as uh, we had the the morning prayer, and then I was uh, sort of sitting there as the songs were going and I was, uh, it reminded me of a, a podcast I was listening to yesterday. And the podcast was talking about different types of people and personality types and how, um, yeah, how we deal with life in different ways. And I was just thinking of this idea of, of rest. Um, and I know we had the heart retreat yesterday and like there was, uh, uh, the team did, did so, so well. I, I didn't do anything. I just sort of came in, was a participant. And the, the team that ran it have done just an incredible amount of work to actually make it happen. Uh, and so I know that like, they're a bit weary and tired, but like, I also know that the people that came to the Heart Retreat as participants were a bit weary and tired just because life. Uh, and then I know that you guys have come this morning and not all of you have jumped out of bed you know, like that. Uh, I know wind jumps out of bed like that, but like the rest of us probably have to roll out of bed and take our meds and, you know, rub, rub our sore joints and all that. And so I was just thinking about this idea of, of rest. Um, and that idea of from Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, which says just, come to me and I will give you rest. Um, the, the, the podcast I was listening to was talking about that whole duck analogy, you know, how the duck is calm on the water, but underneath it's like the, the, legs, are, the legs are going frantic. Um, and it talked about how some people, a lot of people, aren't actually aware of the frantic legs. Like, they, they can see their calm, sort of successful exterior, but they can't see their own legs underwater just going frantic and kicking and kicking and kicking. And so, I, yeah, I just wanted to open it up by just sharing that passage, that um, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, which I'll read through a couple different versions because the languaging is slightly different from version to ver- version to version, like a version. Um, so... Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all those toiling and being burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so I just want to uh, chuck that out there at the start. Um, my, one of my old pastors used to say, you know, you, you just chuck rocks out and the dogs that bark are the ones that get hit. And, uh, you know, if that somehow struck you, then I hope that's a, a message for you. And I might just pray for all of us now before we start. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you are good and you are faithful. We thank you that you are near and you are present. Uh, Lord, I thank you that you are ministering to us through every part of this interaction that we have here, through just community, through people, through the worship through your word, through prayers. Uh, And Lord, I just pray that you'd continue to minister to us as we continue in in this message. So, welcome everyone once again. My name is Kyle, as I mentioned. uh, And I I mentioned that we started this Ephesians series. It's Ephesians called A More Than Able Kind of Life. Uh, This is the second week of the series. It goes for seven weeks all up. Um, and it will go over, yeah, seven weeks over the six chapters, or probably four of the six chapters mainly that we're focusing on. Uh, it will end at Mother's Day, uh, sorry, it includes Mother's Day, and I think it ends on Pentecost. And so we're sort of planning for this series to be a bit of a, a ramp, a bit of a build-up to Pentecost. And uh, we really hope, and I said this last week, uh, we really hope that this is an encouraging, life-giving series for you. Uh, throughout the book, there are just so many references to life, being made alive, having new life. And so we want to walk through these teachings and really flesh out what the Bible says and how it looks in our lives here and now. This Bible was written thousands of years ago, but it has something for us here and now. 
Um, and I, as I mentioned last week, I'm not sure how many, uh, how many of us have actually read through the whole letter just ever, um, or how many of us have read through the letter of Ephesians recently, but I would encourage you over the course of the seven weeks, preferably near the start of the seven weeks, to just spend time reading through the book of Ephesians. It's six chapters, and it won't take uh, very, very long at all. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that, and it sort of helps you piece together, I guess, the whole context of what is happening in the book. And so this series, as I mentioned, is leading right up until Pentecost, uh, which is a, a really significant time in the church's history altogether, but also in our church history. And so it's our hope that as we go along in this series that we are preparing ourselves um, to meet with God in a supernatural way. We have a life group discussion guide, which I mentioned last week. Uh, we'll be having Zoom prayer nights. Uh, we are organizing a Pentecost pause worship night and a prayer night similar to what we had last year. If you came along to that, you'll remember uh, what it was. And as, uh, yeah, so that's sort of all happening throughout the course of this series with the hope that it is just a, an all-encompassing experience for you um, all, all around. And as we get into this passage today, I, I just want you to be aware of the, the setting. Uh, it is a group of churches that have been newly planted in the decades following the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so this is, a, a, Ephesus isn't just like a church, it's a region where there's lots of different churches. Oh, excuse me. Um, and this is a region where there's a whole, haze, a whole host of different influences in terms of cultures um, as well as spiritual beliefs. Uh, it's a coastal area, so that means there's lots of visitors from all over the world or the known world at that stage. Uh, so that means that there's new stories, new philosophies, new ideas about life coming through that space all the time. And so it's this hustling and bustling place of ideas and influence. There's, of course, uh, some young churches located in Ephesus, uh, and these young churches are filled now with like a diverse range of, of people. Initially, back in the day, it was actually quite fairly evident um, between, you know, belief systems uh, based on culture and nationality. Like, you could probably actually guess where people came from based on what they believed, um, and then in some cases, you could actually probably even guess what they believed based on what they looked like. Uh, but now, we have people from multiple cultures, uh, multiple religious backgrounds, multiple nationalities, and they're all coming together uh, under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And so this, unsurprisingly, brings tension, uh, brings frustrations and arguments. In this section, the Apostle Paul sets about trying to settle some of the, the tensions that are building up. Um, so Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul is the author of this letter. And as a reminder... Uh, as well, during the writing of this letter, the people in the church world were largely divided into two people groups. There was the Jewish people group, and then there was the Gentiles. So basically, you understand what Jewish people are. They're from the nation of Israel. Um, and then the Gentiles, it's basically every other person. Um, and so that's sort of the, the two main people groups. And so that's where a little bit of background before we get into our passage for today. So let's read our passage today. Uh, it comes from Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 11 to 22. It says this. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were not excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises that God had made them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Jesus, or Christ Jesus. Once you are far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people group in his own body on the cross. He broke down the walls of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles, creating in himself one new people from two groups. Together, as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility towards one another, or towards each other, was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who are far away from him, and the peace of the, uh, and the peace to the Jews who are near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. 
So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives in his spirit. And so I'll just pray again. God, we ask that you would speak to us. Not through my words or uh, yeah, anything that you know we're trying to, to, to just sort of share, but Lord, that you would speak to us. Uh, yeah, Lord, if, uh, if there's anything in this message that is not of you, Lord, let it just fall to the floor. Uh, Lord, we are listening to your word, your scripture. We are awaiting inspiration by your Holy Spirit. And we are excited by how you are going to impact our lives and change our lives and change the lives of those around us. Amen. So I love the Apostle Paul's type of writings because he can be both so incredibly deep and nuanced and brilliant, and then other times he can also be incredibly insulting in the most endearing type of ways. And so this section actually opens up with these words. It says this, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews, who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you lived apart from Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship of people of Israel. You did not know the covenant promises God made with them. And you lived in a world without God and without hope. So Paul here is basically saying, can I just remind you that you do not belong here? Or at least you used to not belong here. Uh, to quote Gretchen from Mean Girls, you can't sit with us. <laughs> Paul, is, Paul is reminding them that you never used to be part of this club. And then he goes on to say that the Jews, of whom Paul is, used to call the Gentiles uncircumcised heathens. Uh, I know there's kids in the chapel, so you can chat to your parents about the uncircumcised part. Uh, but the word heathens literally means uncivilized, uncultured, uncouth, barbaric even, you know. Keep in mind, Paul is Jewish himself. He's like saying, hey, those white guys with beards from up the front used to call you these things, and it's this guy saying it, you know? So he's sort of dobbing in on himself here, uh, saying that he didn't like the Gentiles, that they didn't want to accept them, uh, and they saw them as some sort of lesser group of people. And even through the whole circumcision, and even though the whole circumcision thing had sort of come quite common, uh, and it's lost its meaning, uh, in a, its significance, I should say, at least the Jewish people still knew and were favored by God, unlike you Gentiles who didn't know God and had no hope and no favor. Gentiles were not approved of. They were not interesting to deal with. Not a people that the religious folk wanted to be around and definitely not the type of people that they wanted sitting next to them in the temples. And then this but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ Jesus himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the walls of hostility that separated us. So that was the setting. And then something changed. Something bigger than laws, something bigger than the cultural religious rituals, something bigger than the long-held traditions like circumcision and whatnot. Um, I was going to make a circumcision joke, but I thought I'd cut it out. Um, but like, <laughs> bigger, something bigger than nationalities and allegiances. Something happened. Jesus Christ happened. And because of Jesus, two parties who were enemies, who were on different paths, were brought together because of this one thing. And reading this made me think of that scene in Spider-Man, uh, No Way Home, where the, the big ship, uh, sorry for those of you that don't watch Marvel, but the ship is falling apart and it's falling into two halves and they're moving away from each other and then Spider-Man reaches out 
and he like pulls the ship back together. He pulls these two halves back together. That's sort of the vision I have of like Jesus straining against like this division and bringing them together. Uh, and so Jesus, as we saw last week, has brought us, brought us back into life with God. You know, you are far... Oh, there it is, yeah. You are far away from God, but through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, you are brought into a saving relationship. But this relationship that you're brought into isn't just a relationship that starts and stops with you and God. This isn't an isolating, sort of self-contained type of relationship. You know those relationships where a mate gets a girlfriend, and all of a sudden, because your mate gets a girlfriend, you've lost a mate? You know those ones where he disappears... Uh, you know what I'm talking about? You know he's alive because you see photos of him on Insta as they soft launch their relationship. You know, there's lots of hiking and cafe photos of his favorite human. The type of relationship that removes you from all other relationships. You know, they get together and now he disappears. You know the ones. Name and shame. Come up later and you can name and shame them. <laughs> but this relationship is, is different than that. This isn't a get into a relationship and disappear type of relationship. This is a get into a relationship and it bleeds into all other parts of your life and all other relationships type of relationship. Jesus brought unity between you and God. And now, because of that, people on opposite sides are being brought near. The wonderful problem with God is that you cannot get near to him without getting near to others who are near to him. A quote I read said that something along the lines of, the most loving thing we can do for others is to love God more. Because when we love God more, we love others better. Mm. But there was this vicious, vicious division in the early church. You do your things your way. We do our things our way. And if we accept you and the way you do things, then it sort of means the way that we used to do things doesn't really matter anymore because all these things are the things that made us special and all these things are the things that made us different and unique. And Paul once again addresses this in his letters, uh, in Galatians, in fact, Galatians chapter 5. says this, So Christ has truly set us free, Make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in the slavery to the law. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be no benefit to you. I say it again. If you are trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you are trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. God's grace through Jesus has set us free. And so the things that we were using to separate ourselves and show that we are special are no longer that wonderful. Verse 16 puts it this way. Together, as one body, Christ reconciled both groups by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. Your hostility towards each other was put to death. And I was reading this passage, and as I was reading it, I couldn't help but thinking of the fact that if we are beneficiaries of God's gracious reconciling and God's healing actions towards us, then, and, and keep in mind, we have grieved God incredibly then how much more so should we be examples of that reconciling grace towards others? Uh, This uh, uh, pastor and commentator and theologian, Israel Kamadzandu, um, who I don't really know anything about apart from the fact that he is a Methodist pastor that studied in Zimbabwe. He he writes this about this passage, and it's really well written. It says, The call of Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, is basically summoning all people to live together as if they were children of one parent. If God is a parent of all humanity, polarization in all its forms should be avoided. 
In the face of racial tensions, the church and its leaders, as well as the laity, should seek to model hospitality. In other words, the church, with its mandate on building the kingdom of God on earth, should choose to change human life by bringing love to places where hate has become the norm. For the 21st century church, the task of building a multicultural church is urgent because in and around the world, we are experiencing institutional racism, hostility towards one another, tribalism, white supremacy resurfacing in ways never seen. Hence, the message of integration and appreciation of diversity is urgently needed. Amen. Which is a much longer and better way of what I am trying to say in that if we are gifted reconciliation by God, then how much more should we be living lives of reconciliation and repaired relationships? If you think of how much we have offended and how much we have disrespected God, and he has taken then the steps to repair that relationship with us, how much more should we be doing that towards the people around us? Especially, especially those that don't fit into the type of people that we always feel at home around. In this passage, we are seeing two types of people, uh, two uh, groups of people being joined together under our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And, and you'll note in a lot of verses in this passage, uh, even just in that verse 16 that we just read, Paul uses the name Christ to uh, describe Jesus. And now if you didn't know any better, you would just assume that that's Jesus' last name. Uh, Joseph Christ, Mary Christ, and their son Jesus. But Christ is more than just a name that we attach to Jesus. It is a title that means something and signifies something. The title Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, and it means anointed one, chosen one. And it is the equivalent of the, uh, the Hebrew word Messiah, Messiah. And it's important because the Apostle Paul is reminding the readers once again that your allegiance, who you find yourself allied with, has moved. You are no longer found under the rule of Judaism and all the rituals and traditions that come with it. You are no longer found under the rule of the Gentiles and the boundaries and the separation. Instead, there is now a new group of people that you are a part of. And that group of people has Jesus the Christ it has Jesus the Christ as its head and king. And if we are now under the allegiance of Jesus, we should be living as if Jesus were the Christ in our lives. And this bleeds into our relationships. And this might not, not naturally sort of be where you think this passage goes. But in my mind, I see Jesus reconciling us to God. And then I see Jesus reconciling Jewish and Gentile people. And it makes me turn my eyes to the relationships that we, the people of God, should be known for. Are we known for reconciling relationships? I wonder if you turn on the news or are you listening to your favorite podcast or you're reading opinion pieces and if they start talking about Christians and the average Christian relationship. Would those people say that we have a healthy relationship where our conflicts and differences are reconciled in a healthy way? Think about that. What do you reckon the average person outside of the church would describe the Christian relationship and reconciliation like? As you travel around the world, you know, you'll start to learn that there are general stereotypes. You know, you travel enough, you'll find that there's just stereotypes uh, within countries Within nations, within age groups, there are cultures who are stereotyped by their hospitality, uh, by their precision engineering, by their seeming unawareness of time and how late they always are, by their value of money, by their nationalistic arrogance, by their laid-back casual nature, by their rudeness. And if you are guessing which nationalities I'm talking about for each one, then you are racist, because these are all fictional examples with no basis in reality, because I do not want to lose my job. But I wonder if Christians are stereotyped by their relationships with people in a good way or a bad way. Are we stereotyped by reconciliation? And I know that word comes loaded with a lot of baggage, uh, and we can all get worried, you know, that someone might think you're the most terrible thing in the world if you use that word reconciliation, which is woke. Uh, 
But this is a movement of God that we see repeated throughout history, throughout humanity's history. God reconciling us back to him. And I can think of so many reasons why we wouldn't want to take that step. Bless you. We've been hurt, let down, we've been rejected, disappointed, attacked, aggrieved. We feel that it's not our job to take that first step. We feel that the other person is too far gone. We don't want to get past all the issues that have been brought up. We're actually content not working through it. And you know, the feelings that you might have, the feelings that the Apostle Paul is addressing in Ephesus, none of this is new. This isn't new to you. It wasn't new to that early church either. I'm sure most of you guys know about a guy called Jonah from the Old Testament. Um, Jonah was a minor prophet in the Old Testament. And uh, I guess a prophet is someone who sort of hears messages from God and, and passes those messages onto the people that God wants to speak to. And the people sort of accept or reject the message. God tells Jonah, I have a message for you to deliver. And now, this is exciting because it doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes there's hundreds of years between, you know, messages from God. Uh, and so maybe Jonah is thinking that he's going to go speak to some big Israelite ruler, uh, you know, some amazing king or queen, someone really special, someone important. But then God tells Jonah that he's going to go uh, and sent to speak a message to the people of Nineveh. I think uh, Nineveh, Nineveh is located near the modern-day Iraq, and, and from what I can gather, Nineveh is, this massive, Nineveh is this massive city, amazing amounts of wealth, amazing amounts of power. Um, they're located within the city, but it's a city full of evil and wicked people. It isn't where the prophet wanted to be sent. It's like finding out that you get a free holiday, but then you find out that the free holiday is to Chernobyl or like Shepparton. And so... Long story short, oh, boom, boom, boom. Uh, long story short, you know, Jonah tries to run away because he doesn't want to share God's message with the people of Nineveh. And after unsuccessful attempts of running away, Jonah eventually goes to Nineveh and preaches the message to the people. And you know what? The city repents. The city reconciles themselves to God. A city that God was going to destroy reconciles themselves to God because Jonah was willing to take that message of reconciliation. And in the last chapter, we find out exactly why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Not because the, people, uh, not because the city was full of terrible people. So read this passage, Jonah chapter 3, verses into chapter 4. When God saw what they had done, this is the people, and how they'd put a stop to their evil way, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he'd threatened. Great. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry, and so he complained to the Lord, didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you were merciful and compassionate, God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive uh, than what I predicted would happen. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he didn't want those people reconciled to God. Not because he didn't, that the place was too evil. He didn't want them to have a chance of reconciliation. How big is that? His disdain and dislike for those people almost put a wall between God and the people of Nineveh. Who knows? If Jonah didn't go, who knows what would have happened to that city? Maybe God would have raised up another person and they would have said yes and they would have gone. Or maybe that group of people would have never reconciled to God. But think of that. Jonah had such a low opinion of those people uh, that he hoped reconciliation would never find them. He hoped that they would never meet the merciful and compassionate God that Jonah supposedly served. But now I want to counteract that story that we can find ourselves in with the story that we should find ourselves in. And I, I might invite the band to come back on stage as we're finishing up. Uh, this is from Ephesians, uh, first chapter of Ephesians. It says this. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope which he has called, uh, to which he has given those he has called his holy people who are rich and glorious in, 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 uh, rich in his glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand 
the incredible greatness of God's power for those of us who believe. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for those of us who believe. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the high place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. God, in his amazing grace and kindness, has not only stepped into our world and become a reconciler to us, but he is more than able to fill us with his power so that we can become reconcilers ourselves. Because if we are honest, we're all like that early church. We're all like Jonah. The idea of repairing relationships is not something that brings us a whole lot of joy because quite often it means sacrifice and it takes an act of mercy. It requires you to let go of feelings of justified anger and animosity and bitterness. It requires you opening up your circle of friends that you've kept so cultivated for so long. It requires admitting, you know, even though you don't want to, that bridging the gap and building relationships is the right thing to do. It requires you to admit that there are going to be people that don't look like you, that don't think like you, that don't dress like you, that don't value the same things as you. They're going to be standing next to you coming into the kingdom of God. And I'm not sure whether you want to hear this or not, but God has chosen us to bear witness to his reconciliation story. God has chosen us to be the billboard that advertises his movement to repair relationships. And we happily accept that relationship that between him and us. We happily accept that re- reconciliation story between God and us. Yes, amazing. That's a big yes from me. Thank you. We're taking that deal every day of the week. But when that story moves from us to others, it gets a little complicated, doesn't it? Because, well, quite frankly, we don't want to. And they're not nice people. And I don't want them to repent. I don't want this relationship restored. I don't want to have to work through the stuff that's in between us. And also, I don't like them. They do things differently. I enjoy my life without that complicated relationship. Well, you know who else is often not nice? and breaks really good, perfect relationships. All y'all, you guys, all of you, all of me. And yet, and yet, and I guess I wanna finish off this message with this reminder that we were all in a position where there was no good reason, no good reason for God to reconcile himself to us. And yet, we had done nothing deserving to bring on that reconciliation. And yet, God did. And all of us are now walking billboards of the work of God in us. And I wonder what it would look like for Christians to be stereotyped as people who work tirelessly towards healthy and redeemed relationships with people around them. Redeeming relationships that look, think, and act differently to us I know we have to be careful about boundaries in relationships. Like I know that. I know we have to be careful about standards and sort of who we accept and toxic relationships and abusive relationships. I I know that. I know that. I understand. I understand. But imagine a movement of people who are known for reconciling relationships. For us to be holy people, set apart, reconciled back to God's family. God removing the curse of sin between us and Him and then giving us the power and the desire to become ambassadors of reconciliation ourselves. We are a living testimony of God's kindness and grace. And as people see us, they need to be seeing the work of God in us. God's people must be defined by God's character. That is what I see in this passage call to become more like Christ in our relationships. And I know some of you are feeling hopeless about some broken relationships in your life, but I want to encourage you to hold out on hope. That there is someone greater than you at work in this world. There is someone greater than you at work in the hearts and lives of the people around you. Stay near to God. 
Stay near to God and trust Him to do the work. Yeah? I'm going to invite, um, yeah, obviously the band to, to, to play and lead us in worship, but during the time as well, the, the prayer team will be coming up to the front. And if there is rest that you want, come and pray. If there's reconciliation and hurt and relationships that you want God to work in, or you want God to work in you, come and pray. The prayer team is up here to do ministry with you and for you, even if you don't know what it is you want to say. We will try and minister on your behalf. So uh, I guess we can jump to our feet and I'm going to let the band take it from here.
want you to take a look around. Okay, just look around, look at the people around from one side to the other. Do you know when we're going to reach the point where we're fulfilling the, the stuff that Pastor Carl was sharing from the Word? It's when there's more different kinds of people that's in the same room. Amen? People that don't look like us, they don't necessarily have the same stories, the same history. You know, I, I really value the fact that our Ukrainian, you know, brothers and sisters are here. It's like, I've seen it since I first stepped in as a senior pastor. I knew this. I go, a multicultural church is going to be one of the greatest witnesses of the reality of Jesus because it shows we can get along. Not because of our history, our color, our commonality, but because of the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah? And so I pray that, and but part of that is to do this simple thing, okay? I often have to ask myself this question. Whatever angst you might have, whatever expression of Christianity you want, ask yourself, is the person being ungodly or is it just different? Is it an issue of ungodliness that I'm dealing with and I'm angry and frustrated about? Or is it it's just different? And to be honest, more often than not, it's just different. Can I hear an amen? Because if it's just different, then it's not them. It's you. And that's a question I ask myself time and time again as a mirror to my own soul and my own heart so that I can own my own stuff so that I can take the plank out of my own eye before I take the speck out of someone else's. Amen? And I think if all of us just did that simple thing, is it just an issue of being ungodly or just different? If we all did that bit by bit, we can take small steps towards seeing what Pascal was sharing from the Word. Amen? Yeah, so I'm going to pray. I'm going to bring it to a close, but love for you to be able to respond. The team's up here for prayer. If you want rest, come to the front, pray for rest. If there's things that God has laid upon your heart from this word about the sacrifice that you, God is prompting you to make to be able to make that step of reconciliation, then, then come up, pray and ask for that great power of God to come within you so that He can change your heart to take that step as a reconciler. Yeah? And if there's any other thing that you need prayer for, please come to the front. Let me just pray and we'll bring this to a close. Lord God, we just want to thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, we thank you for the great wisdom and mystery that is in Christ. I, I, I just love it so much, God, that when we say Jesus died on the cross for us and He rose again, the implication of that is not just in our relationship with You, but the implication in how this whole world would get along with each other. And so, God, I pray that You will begin here in our world, our circle, our relationships, our families, our church, our community, and Lord God, help us to help us become aware we do have that heart of Jonah. Uh, where if it's us that we need work in, God, we pray that you would do that work in us. To tear down the walls of prejudice, to tear down the walls of righteousness, self-righteousness and cultural self-righteousness, God. And help us to, to then be able to be that bridge and that reconciling bridge to the people around us. I pray for that day, God, as you continue to do this work within us, that this would be a place, God, a community filled like that Spider-Man that you would bring multiple different broken pieces and parts, different shapes, colors, sizes, stories coming together under you as our head because our allegiance is now with you. So Lord God, we just thank you and pray for your blessing and your peace to be upon your people in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you.